get in your seats because we've got an SE exam study problem, practice problem. If you're studying for the PE as well, this is great knowledge to have. Even if you're not studying for any tests, this is a common uh, calculation that you need to run in the professional field when you're designing uh, a masonry structure. So uh, I think it's gonna be applicable for everyone. All right, we have some design criteria. We're using the ASCE 716. I know that's gonna switch here in the, the you know coming year or, or the next little bit. So uh, make sure you're paying attention to code changes. We're using the TMS 402602 uh, 2016 edition, and we have 12 inch thick CMU wall. I got a little figure over here. Why did I spit all over my screen? Our figure shows a 20 foot tall interior non-load bearing wall. Uh, it has lateral bracing at the top, so it's adequately braced uh, from movement at the top and it's pinned at its base. We're in seismic country, so we're designing for lateral forces or out of plane forces uh, due to seismic effects, uh, specifically acceleration of uh, the wall mass itself and inducing a applicable load on that wall. Uh, 16 by 12 block, we have one and a half inch face shell widths. So that was specified in the design data. And then that, what that means here, uh, if I do a little bit more in blue, that is your face shell. And that will be important moving forward here. You can get different thickness of face shells depending on the CMU block that you are working with, or just even if it's not CMU, but masonry block, it can be brick, it can be other uh, variations of, of clay. This wall self weight is 55 PSF, so we don't have to calculate ourselves. Uh, the horizontal seismic force, F sub P, is 17 PSF, so that we also don't need to calculate here today. Uh, our SDS is 1.0. Uh, we have hollow concrete masonry units, type S mortar, face shell bedded only. Again, I'll draw on our figure here. That means our mortar is only going on the face shell. It's not going into any of the the like web zones in the middle here. So everything that I'm drawing in green here is not getting any mortar and that affects our design. So it's things you need to consider. Uh, it's ungrouted, unreinforced, which is funny because in a seismic, high seismic area and commonly an SDS of 1.0 is a very high seismic region. Uh, you are not permitted to do an ungrouted, unreinforced masonry wall. Even if it's non-load bearing, I don't, I don't believe it's permitted for any type of wall. So it's kind of funny, um, but we're going to prove why that is. We're using allowable stress design today, ASD, no strength design. It, this is an assumption used for today's calculation. But in professional practice, you can use either ASD or LRFD for the design of masonry. Uh, I have actually, it's interesting been swayed one way over another. I used to design using ASD and then I switched over to strength design, which is also referred to as LRFD design. So, well, first off, we're designing using the ASCE 7. So we need to get our load criteria into proper load combinations. For today's example, we have seismic design. So we have two load combinations. Uh, one of them, uh, including a heavier dead load in combination with your seismic effects, and then one of them including a lighter dead load in combination with your seismic effects. Because we are looking for the ultimate, or excuse me, the highest tensile stress on this wall, uh, that means we are going to want to use the load combination with a lower load combo um, that gets you a lower dead load because dead load on a wall is helping counteract tensile stresses that develop due to out of plane loading. You can find it in chapter 12. You can find it in chapter two, I believe, of the AC7. EV, that's your vertical component of your seismic demand. That equals 0 0.2 SDS times dead load. Again, from chapter 12, SDS is simply 1.0 that was given to us. Dead load, just leave it as a variable. And if we solve for that, that turns into 0 0.2 dead load. So that will switch positions with that variable. 0 0.6 dead load minus 0 0.7 times 0 0.2 dead load. All that in parentheses. Plus 0 0.7 E sub H. E sub H is our horizontal seismic effects. If we reduce all of that further in the dead load, 
that gets us 0 0.46 dead load plus 0 0.7 E sub H. For today's example, E sub H equals F sub P. F sub P is just another seismic uh, force. And in this case, F sub P is how, is, is the variable that's used for getting your out of plane loading due to seismic effects. So F sub P equals 17 PSF. Uh, if that wasn't given to us, you'd have to get the dead load of your wall and then head to ASCE 716, chapter 1211, and use the equation there to get your FP force. Well, 0 0.7 E sub H equals 11.9 PSF once it go goes through the load combination. Now we need our dead load. Well, our wall dead load was given as 55 PSF. That comes out to 25.3 PSF for dead load. This simply means we have 25.3 PSF load for every foot of wall that we have. We are trying to determine stresses at the mid height of the wall. We have a 20 foot tall wall overall, so we know we're 10 feet tall. As we move down this wall, we keep increasing the dead load um, on the wall, right? At the base of the wall down here, you have an entire wall stacked above itself. So the full weight of the wall, as opposed to if you were one, you know, one foot down from here, you only have one foot of wall sitting, uh, being supported at that point. So as you get lower down the wall, the weight of your wall increases, which changes your stress in your wall. We have a lateral, uniformly distributed lateral load of 11.9 PSF. Well, we have two diagrams to draw here. I'll go in blue. We have P required. P rec is for ASD design. It would be P ultimate or P sub U if we were doing strength design. That looks a little something like this. So this is your axial diagram. So it's a max down at the base and it's zero at the top. At mid span, it's going to be 25.3 PSF times 10 feet. And then we also have M rec, your required uh, moment. Again, I'm kind of drawing it slightly off a of scale here. I get that. But we all know uniformly distributed load on a beam creates, oh, horrendous, creates that moment diagram and at mid span is where you have your maximum moment and my big fat head was in the way this whole time uh maximum moment is wl squared over eight so let's get both of those things next we need to convert these demands into stresses equals p over a plus or minus m over s let's keep it basic here let's keep it simple it's a it's an se example problem so you're just gonna this one would fall into that six minute design category um and you know it, it shouldn't get too involved even though they give you a lot of info here they want to keep it basic enough all right well a is only going to be where we placed our mortar so our bed joints were only along the face shell um, this is per 12 inches of length of wall or one foot length of wall so it's not a, a full block or anything like that, but that those two face shells run continuous along your wall length. So A is gonna be equal to one and a half inches times 12 inches. And we have two of those for a total area of 36 inches squared per foot of wall. We need to know S and it's gonna be S about this axis. Now there's a couple ways to go about this. I grabbed this figure and then the following equation from the AISC steel manual, which I have right over here. And if you go, it's one of my tabs, go to the back, table 17-26, it's properties, or actually table 17-27, properties of geometric sections. They have a bunch of different scenarios with really, really useful equations for you to use. In this instance, they have this. So. Using this equation, that's where I got it from. There it is. Let's plug in for it. And let's remember here, the 
width, although it's a 12 inch block, that's actually 11 and uh, 0.63 inches. So you got to remember that. And then if you're subtracting your one and a half, one and a half, one and a half and one and a half face shell, that's subtracting three inches from 11.76, giving you a D1 of 8.63, okay? 11.63 uh, minus three, 8.63, okay. S comes out to equaling 160 inches to the third. All right, let's plug everything in. There we go, everything's plugged in. Now, let's get the total net tensile stress on our wall. Now in this instance, our force Lateral force is coming from that direction, so that's the orientation we're looking at. We're looking at a cross section of the wall, if you will. Now we have, if I go blue, two stresses applied on top of this wall. You have P over A, and that's uniform across the top. Then you have M over S, and now this has a reversal, so it has positive and negative stress because at the inside face, or this face right here, your wall is bend, uh, how do I wanna do this? I don't wanna do this. Your wall, if I draw it, bending like this, which means you have compressive stresses on that inside face, and then you have the outside face of the wall, tensile stresses pulling away, okay? Think about your concrete beam, think about a beam, simply supported beam in bending under load. We put rebar at the bottom of the beam because that's where the tensile stresses um, are are located so that beam those beam the concrete is trying to pull away from itself so that's the same you know concept that we have going on here so in this instance the m over s on this side is going to be negative p over a is positive and that's constant but then the m over s on this side is equal and opposite but in this side is positive stress is going to equal p over a plus M over S, and on this face of the wall, it's gonna equal P over A minus M over S. And that's what they come out to. You have a positive stress, cumulative, uh, so compressive, positive is compressive in this case, 51.6 PSI, and then on the outside face of the wall, you have a negative or a tensile stress of 37.56 PSI. And that's, there's load reversal here. In an earthquake, we don't just we don't just apply load in one direction. It happens both ways in a shaking, in an event. So this is applicable for both sides of that wall. Well, that comes out to our answer today. However, however, let's take this a step further because we just we were just on the load derivation uh, side of things and the demand side of things. But what about the capacity side of things? Because in the real world, like the real engineers that we are, we're trying to get better here. You wouldn't just use this information and tell your boss, so here you go. See you later, job's done. No, you have to design for it. What are you gonna do now? Well, is the wall adequate as is? Let's find out quick. And I promise you this won't take long. Well, in order to determine if we have enough tensile capacity of our mortar and of our wall, we need to determine F sub T, and this is for an allowable design. So it's the allowable flexural tensile stress of masonry. And you can find this in the TMS on, in the, um, I believe it's in the ASD chapter. Um, but I do know it's table 8.2.4.2. Now we were given type S mortar and today we're gonna say it's not air entrained because that is an option within the table that you need to determine if you do or do not have that. Um, it really comes down to the tensile capacity of your masonry is dependent upon the mortar that you're using because the mortar is, in layman's terms, the glue of your wall. So it doesn't matter how strong your masonry blocks are per se, um, the weak link is the glue itself. So depending on the glue that you specify um, and how you specify and how the loads are being applied to that glue is how much tensile capacity you have uh, on your side to combat you know forces and i did mention that it has to do with the application of the load so for us today you either have to determine if your force is normal to the bed joint or parallel to the bed joint we have bricks or we have blocks in a wall here our force is being applied this way we talked about our tensile stresses going that direction and our bed joint is right here and it's, it's the flat surface, you know, that's in between our blocks. It's the mortar. So that means we have a 90 degree angle 
from the bed joint to our tensile stress. It's the, it's the location of your tensile stress that they specifically ask for. So 90 degrees, another way to say 90 degrees is the force is normal to our bed joint. So that is our application today. When we go to this table, you will find F sub T equal to 33 PSI based on the parameters that we had, type S and not Aaron trained, all that kind of stuff. Well, 33 PSI is less than our required tensile stress, which equals negative 37.57 PSI. So this wall is inadequate to handle out of plane seismic forces uh, for this this building within this seismic region. So we are no good. So you would have to uh, do some type of strengthening in order to, to bring up the strength of the wall, whether that's grouting it, partially grouting it, installing rebar, you know, uh, fiber reinforced polymers on the outside face, something along those lines, but it's, uh, or bracing it uh, some place up along the wall. There's a lot of different things you can do and engineer uh, to get to a solution, but as is this wall is inadequate. So that gives you much more engineering information and a better path forward for the design team to say, okay, this doesn't work. This is what we might need to do to make it work, blah, blah, blah. Instead of just saying, oh, I got the forces. There's the forces. There you go. I'm all done. It doesn't matter. Do we have a problem here? If that's what you as an engineer, that's your number one goal is to determine. So I think adding this little extra step at the end is, is really beneficial. Um, all right, I'm blabbering. Hey, like, subscribe if you haven't yet, if you're trying to better yourself as an engineer, if you're trying to spread the word, we're trying to build this community of structural engineers, civil engineers, just engineers in general in the YouTube community. So I'm trying to do that here. Throw your boy a bone and let somebody know about the channel. All right, I'll catch you next time. Peace.